The island of Crete is steeped in history. The Minoan settlement of Knossos, often called Europe's oldest city, was founded around 7000 BC and abandoned around 1100 BC. It was discovered in 1878. Sir Arthur Evans began excavating the site in 1900, which continued for 35 years, yielding an exciting look at one of Europe's oldest civilizations. <laughs> Religion has also been a major influence in the history of Crete. The Apostle Paul visited Crete to preach in about 58 AD. As other commitments were necessary to attend to, Paul ordained St. Titus to be Bishop of the island and left him to finish the work he had started. St. Titus's skull is venerated in the Church of St. Titus, located in Heraculon, Crete. Religion remains a center point of Cretan culture. Good morning from our beautiful village, Vizari, in the municipality of Amari. We are here at the Church of the Virgin Mary. I have been a priest here for the last 10 years, and we do our best for the people living here. So this is our church, with the holy icons and the wall paintings. This is the bishop's throne, where a bishop sits when he is attending the liturgy. He usually comes twice a year, during the period of Lent and on Christmas. The divine liturgy takes place in there. There's the altar table and the chapel of Prothesis on the left. That's where we celebrate the divine liturgy on Sundays and other holidays. Glory to God. Our village is a small village a small village in this region. But God is everywhere, and He provides the same for one person, for many, or for few. And with God's grace, we try to perform our duties. We keep trying. Another event happened between 1300 and 2000 years ago that would forever shape Crete and its inhabitants. Olive trees were planted on the island. For centuries they have been the lifeblood of the island. These old-growth trees, called monumentals, continue to bear fruit today. Harvesting fruit from these trees takes time, as nets are placed on the ground to capture the fruit as it falls from the trees. Farmers have discovered that planting extra virgin trees increases the efficiency of harvesting, thus being more profitable. Efforts to save the monumentals are underway, beginning with identifying the age of the trees. There are certain steps that need to be implemented. So we have to, to approach it in a scientific way. First of all, we have to characterize the genetic identity of most of the trees. This is something nowadays that is not difficult. 10 or 15 years or 20 years ago, this was difficult, but now it's quite easy. You take a sample, you extract your DNA, and you can have the genetic identity of these trees. In order to determine if a tree qualifies as a monumental, First, the age of the tree must be determined. This process is much simpler than in years past. No longer must the tree be sacrificed in order to count the rings. The ring count, you know, is also a good way if you have the, the full trunk. If the trunk is empty, it's not so easy. You have to take a piece of wood from inside of the trunk, the gufala as we say here, and then send it to some specialized lab to determine. Right. The, this is another another way to get an idea about the, the age of the tree, which is also important, because yeah. not all the trees are of similar age. I'm sure some of your trees there in the area, in the Amari area, will be older than others, yeah. depending on the yeah. diameter of the trunk. 
So this way might be another way to, to determine and this can, we think is going to be part of the proposal we are going to submit, to identify the age of certain trees. Excellent. Through science, we can uh, somehow validate the unique identity of these trees. They, long there for, they live there for hundreds of years, so we, have, uh, we are obliged to preserve them, not only because they can uh, be a sustained, uh, let's say, business or for any grower, but it can also support, uh, support the, the area the aesthetic and, as we call the, the topography or the areas. One of these areas is the Amari Valley in Central Crete. Life here hasn't changed much for centuries. Locals continue to harvest olives from the monumental trees in the traditional way. But even here, beneath the towering Mount Ide, extra virgin trees are beginning to make inroads. Because the olive that they actually extract the oil from is a relatively small olive. It has a large pit and not a whole lot of meat. So that means that even though the pit has oil, that you need a lot of these olives to start filling barrels. Probably plant, I'm going to say, uh, 100 to 200,000 new olive trees every year on the island. They're just... Uh, changing the landscape. Well, if you notice, there's, there's two different colors on these leaves. This is what would be considered the top side of the leaf. It's sort of leathery. But you go to the bottom side of the leaf and you get a different color. And uh, if, if we had a microscope, you'd see cilia, all these tiny hairs on the, the bottom of the leaf. And today, these leaves are, are wide open because it's humid. But when it gets dry, that's like this one here, it sort of curls up. Okay, and what it's doing is it, the uh, outer part or the upper part of the leaf is curling up and protecting the cilia on the, on the bottom side because the tree actually absorbs an amazing amount of water from the cilia. So it's not just trying to get water from the from the earth, which it does, it gets water from the earth, but it also gets a lot of water from the atmosphere. And that's why you've got cilia on the leaves. It's unusual to have cilia on, cilia on the leaves in most trees, but this tree thrives by it. If you have a farm that does not need their trees to be watered, our trees are drought tolerant and we they're only rain fed. So that means that we don't need uh, big projects to keep our trees alive. Uh, you get a big project that delivers water to trees that need them, you also have to pay for the water. You, you don't have to water an extra virgin tree if you don't want to, but if you don't, they don't produce. So if you don't water them, you don't get any olives from them. You water them, they'll give you olives. The question is, how do you get the water to the trees? sort of something new in that part of the world where you literally see an entire valley with a reservoir that's dedicated to only olive trees and you are not invited. You are not invited into those fields. Despite the influx of extra virgin trees, many locals are not about to sacrifice the life they have known for so long. Change comes slowly, if at all, in the Amari Valley. Uh, when I was visiting Crete to choose a, pl the, a certain place I was looking for, I saw the Amari Valley, a, a place that was quite um, isolated in the style of the villages. So I just said, okay, I'm here. I'm going to sign my documents and I'm coming here. So that was the very first reason I chose that place. By living there, I loved the people very much. 
and uh, I like their uh, rural uh, way of living. I came to know uh, quite a lot of things about the uh, olive trees. What I want to tell you is that um, reading books and getting to know more, some more things about the, uh, these olive trees is that at Crete, all year around the, the very old period of times, from the Minoan time till today, the very main income of Cretans was the oil. Uh, oil was very important for the Minoans, was very important for the, the Dorians and all those people that passed through the uh, Cretan history until today. To extract the oil, the whole olive, including the pit, is mashed into a pulp. For centuries, the oil was extracted using the cold press method, whereby the oil was physically squeezed from the pulp. Today, the pulp is run through a centrifuge, which separates the oil from the waste. Regardless of the process, preserving this lifeblood of the island takes time, money, and dedication. Well, we've been working uh, for several years, and several. the idea is that uh, we, could, uh, we were thinking to take a advantage, and there was a European project uh, with many countries, Italy, France, uh, and uh, other European countries from the Mediterranean region and uh, Northern Africa, in which uh, the idea was to exploit genetic resources. So this is a genetic resource here in, in Crete, and this is a very good way to explore it and try to diversify our olive oil yes. products here, because there is a strong competition from countries, the new countries, Australia, even China, well, has production problems, Chile and other countries, they grow olive oil right. and they grow Koroneki, right. the premium Greek uh, olive oil cultivar. So we have to diversify and produce products that nobody else can. And this is, I think, the right choice to base our strategy on monumental and ancient right. olive trees. Yeah. The important thing is that you have these monumental trees. Exactly. This is yeah, something you, you cannot find it anywhere. Cannot find it in China, in Australia, in Chile, <laughs> no other country, right? So there is a thousand years of tradition in olive culture. Yes. There is history, culture, and as I said to some uh, presentations in in some local conferences, that uh, essentially we sell a product, but also we sell our culture yes. because is uh, is definitely linked to the culture of this, uh, of the island and of this country, basically, from yeah. months and years. Yeah. But up to now, some people are sensitized and hopefully by getting into research and uh, identify genetic identity, maybe particular quality characteristics, nutritional value of this monovarietal olive oils, will be able to show to the people and the growers that own such kind of trees that uh, this is a source of, of uh, gold for them the and they thing. don't have to go and, uh, and take them away. Right. So that, the, the, this the, might be criminal because it took thousands of years to grow. It's it part of the environment, it yeah. And should be, this should be forbidden. I have a, I had a dear friend, he, he passed away about 10 years ago, Hal Halalambos. Halalambos uh, uh, loved his daughter. He only had one child, Eftishia, um, his daughter, and uh, she went to Hanya, one of the big cities on the island, and she fell in love with a, an agriculturist that worked for the uh, the Mediterranean Mediterranean Agronomic Agronomics Institute of Hanyang, and uh, he came back after they were married, and they sat down with uh, he sat down with his son-in-law and his daughter and said, 
talk to me about what you have, your plans for the field that he had just below his house that had 100 ancient trees in it. 100. Been in his family for who knows how long. And uh, their daughter said that since they had a well on the property, it would be very good to actually knock all these old trees down and plant extra virgin olive oil trees to be watered by the well that produces more than enough water for what they would need for the summer. This is long before the reservoir arrived. And Haranvos grudgingly said, okay, and almost went mad. Uh, when he was watching them bulldoze down these old trees. On the island of Crete, of course, they claim that the oldest olive trees on earth are still growing on that island, 3,500 years old. The old trees literally will have to be rediscovered. And um, I don't know whether, you know, these things even exist, but there is an ambiance around an old tree and an old grove that is unique and that seems to give you a uh, pause to appreciate what these old trees have done.